Welcome to Newsmax TV. I'm Ashley Martella. NATO airstrikes have killed 14 insurgents after a joint patrol with Afghan soldiers came under fire. The bloodshed comes just days before that country's parliamentary elections and amidst continuing tension stemming from that Florida pastor's now called off Koran burning event. Just returning from Afghanistan is William R. Polk. He joins us now from New York. A descendant of the nation's 11th president, James K. Polk, William Polk served as an advisor to President Kennedy and later became a professor of history at the University of Chicago, where he established the Center for Eastern Studies. Welcome to Newsmax again, Mr. Polk. Thank you very much, sir. Afghanistan's parliamentary election is slated for this Saturday, the country's second parliamentary election since the 2001 invasion overthrew the Taliban. Why are those elections so important? Well, I think they're really not important as part of the problem that we face. The uh, election procedure to create a democracy is a Western idea. It's not an Afghan idea. The Afghans believe in an entirely different process of consensus. What happens in a typical Afghan village is that the, the certain number of the people in the village are recognized by their fellow villagers as being important people and helpful people, and they become a little council uh, that helps to solve the village problems. But we came in and decided that we wanted to do something on our style, which is elections. And the Afghans uh, were fascinated with this, but it isn't really their procedure. And so uh, much of what's happening today in Afghanistan is a, is a complicated thing of our trying to follow our procedure in their country, and they're trying to keep their own procedure, but very interested in what we're trying to do to them so that it has made a complicated political problem. Do you think democracy has a future in Afghanistan? Well, I think it has a different kind of future than ours. They have uh, something very close to what we call participatory democracy in every village. There are 22,000 villages in Afghanistan, and practically every one of them has a little committee of the elders and respected people in the village who help solve the village problems. But every village is autonomous and doesn't have much to do with its neighbors. And uh, the idea is that each village then uh, creates a, a group that uh, is promoted to the next level, to the, the tribe or the region. And finally, that cultima, cultivate, uh, culminates in a, um, an overall system that's called the lawyer jirga, which is a national assembly. And the national assembly isn't really a congress in the sense of our Congress or Senate, it's um, sort of like the uh, organization that wrote our Constitution. It deals with the basic problems of how the country is organized. But it's a different form of political organization from ours. And one of the great problems that we have in Afghanistan and, and in many other parts of the world is that we don't pay enough attention to the way other people do their, their lives. We think that our way is the right way to do it, and so we try to make them do it our way. And often that results in things that are not what we want. Some 150,000 U.S. and NATO troops are in Afghanistan fighting the Taliban. It's been nine long years, and you've watched closely. Is our strategy the right one, and what progress are we seeing, if any? I think we've not seen any serious progress of any kind. In fact, I think the war is winding down. Um, the, um, there are no cases uh, of insurgencies being defeated. There's a famous old Kenyan uh, story of the lion fighting the flea. The lion is big and strong and the flea is small and nimble, so the lion swats at the flea and every once in a while he may hit one. But lions don't defeat fleas. We have a lion there, a hundred or so thousand troops, but the Taliban are the fleas. They, they bite and then jump away and melt into the countryside and then come back and bite again. And that's been going on, as you say, for nine years. And I think the chances are that it's not sustainable very much longer. What impact does the arrival of General Petraeus have on the success of the war there? Uh, unfortunately, I don't think it has any serious impact at all. General Petraeus is trying to do basically a military solution. And uh, the problem with a military solution is that it doesn't lead anywhere. What we've got to do at some point is to recognize that we have to negotiate an end of the war. Every insurgency has ended in negotiations, and General Petraeus admits that. But to have 100,000 troops or so there fighting uh, has actually made negotiations more difficult. 
what they've done is they've created a list of some 2,000 members of the Taliban. That is virtually the entire organizational head of the Taliban. And they have them on a list to be killed, to be uh, killed or uh, simply arrested and put away in prison. And that's made negotiations impossible. So that what we're trying to do is to rely on killing enough people to uh, bring the war to a halt. But every time we kill one person, uh, at least one or maybe two other people now join the insurgency. And so we've created a great deal of hostility to ourselves. What would it take to begin a proper withdrawal from Afghanistan, and when do you see it happening? I see it could happen very soon if we do the right kind of thing. What we're trying to do, basically, or what our aid people are trying to do, is to provide things that the Afghans presumably want, schools, hospitals, bridges, roads, and things like that, with the hope that that will win them over to our side. But General Petraeus has said that all these things are just the tactics of the war. He said, money is my best ammunition. And of course, the Afghans know that. So every time we try to do anything nice uh, in our terms for them, they regard that as just a, our way of dominating them. What we need to do is change that position. We need to change the context in which we operate, what I call the political psychology of the war. And if we could do that, then we could get into a negotiated period very quickly. Some say an unconditional withdrawal from Afghanistan would be tantamount to the United States surrendering in the war on terror. How do you respond to that, sir? Well, uh, I think the most important thing is that slogans like that tend to make us stop thinking. And what we need to do above all else is to think what's smart and what's, what's good for our country and good for the things that we want to have happen. First of all, we don't have to have an unconditional withdrawal of, from Afghanistan. In fact, what we need to do is have a conditional withdrawal. We need to negotiate so that we know exactly what we're doing rather than suddenly being caught in a situation where we just pull out, where we so-called cut and run. Nobody really of any intelligence, I think, wants us to do anything like that. But what we need to do is to figure out how we can get uh, out and make Afghanistan safe, not have it be any longer a haven for terrorists. And I talked the other day to one of the former senior members of the Taliban, and he said they're prepared to give an ironclad guarantee that the terrorists will never again, if they ever did, use Afghanistan for an attack on any other country. We know that the people who attacked the United States did not operate out of Afghanistan, they operated out of Europe. And there are now, according to American intelligence, less than 100 Al-Qaeda operatives still in Afghanistan. I think we can be absolutely certain in any negotiations we have that Afghanistan is never again used as a base for any kind of terrorism. But there are also those who say setting a date certain for withdrawal just allows the Taliban or anybody who wants, who wants to attack us to just wait it out. Well, there's an argument to be made for that. That's a, that's a fair statement. But of course, the Taliban are not stupid and they read things that we write and so forth. And a great many of the people in America and in Europe who have been in favor of the attack on Afghanistan in the past have now turned against it. Uh, in the European uh, allies, uh, some of the countries are now pulled out. Some of the others are on the brink of pulling out. One government actually failed because it didn't pull out fast enough was Holland. And something like 70% of the population of England is opposed to the war and about 60% in Germany. And um, I think the chances are very good that the Taliban know as much about that as we do. And some of our people here in the United States who were very strong advocates of the war have now said, it isn't worth it, let's get out. And the Taliban, of course, already know that. So simply announcing a date isn't going to give them anything different from what they already know. In your opinion, is the Taliban an enemy of the United States? No, I think the Taliban is, uh, is solely concerned with its domestic affairs. Uh, the Taliban has never attacked anybody uh, anywhere abroad. And of course, Afghanistan is a poor, remote little country, which is uh, impossible uh, to attack the United States. It has no ability to move outside the country in any way. What, what I have read and talked to the leaders of the Taliban and, and what I've heard from all of our intelligence and diplomatic and military people is uh, the, the Taliban really wants to run its own country in its own way. And um, they're less concerned with us 
And if we get out, I think that uh, the chances are pretty good that we can ultimately establish a better relationship, as we did in Vietnam. All right, finally, does Islamophobia exist in the U.S. given all the controversy over the Ground Zero Mosque? And how does the debate over such issues impact the way Muslims here and around the world feel about America? Well, it certainly is a very sad and tragic thing. Uh, we live in a world of diversity and uh, people are different everywhere, which is what makes life interesting, I think. If you sat down at a table and the only thing you could eat was salt, uh, then you'd, be, uh, uh, you'd have a very boring meal. But to have a multiplicity of possibilities makes life much more attractive to all of us. And to turn against any one religion, whether it's uh, Judaism or Islam or Hinduism or Buddhism or any other uh, faith, is, in my opinion, a very sad thing. And it certainly has created a great deal of hostility to the United States. A lot of the Muslims feel that the war in, in Afghanistan, like the war in Iraq, was really our hostility to Islam rather than our hostility to their governments or their, their policies. Former Kennedy advisor William R. Polk, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you very much. And thank you for watching Newsmax TV.